Good afternoon. I'd like to thank the Association of Obstetric Anesthesiologists of India for inviting me to speak about acute respiratory distress syndrome in pregnancy. I am a practicing maternal fetal medicine specialist and critical care physician in the cardiac surgery intensive care unit. Over the next 20 minutes, I plan to review the most common causes of ARDS in pregnancy, the fundamentals of treatment, and several landmark studies in ARDS. With the emergence of the COVID-19 pandemic, attention to the recognition, diagnosis, and treatment of ARDS has become one of the most, has become more important for obstetricians and obstetric anesthesiologists worldwide. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, the most common causes of ARDS in pregnancy were infections such as influenza and bacterial pneumonia, preeclampsia, eclampsia, and aspiration. Less common etiologies include pyelonephritis, septic abortion, toxic shock syndrome, amniotic fluid embolism, and transfusion-related acute lung injury. One would be remiss to give a talk about ARDS in pregnancy and not briefly review the physiologic changes of pregnancy. This foundational knowledge is critical in order for one to decipher changes from normal and recognize respiratory distress in the pregnant patient. I mentioned these at the beginning of our discussion because these changes are important to understand as we review the fundamentals of treatment of acute respiratory distress syndrome. The normal physiologic changes in pregnancy include a respiratory alkalosis with a pH of 7.4 to 7.47. The pCO2 generally ranges from 28 to 34, and the PO2 can drop as low as 90 in the supine position in the second and third trimester. There is a compensatory decrease in bicarbonate of 18 to 24, and there is no change in the respiratory rate. However, there's an increase in the tidal volume and increase in the minute ventilation by approximately 40%. There's a decrease in functional residual capacity and residual volume by approximately 20%. Pregnant women are prone to hypoxemia due to decreased functional residual capacity, increased alveolar ventilation, and increased oxygen consumption. They are also prone to aspiration due to delayed gastric emptying and functional displacement of the lower esophagus. ARDS is characterized by severe hypoxemia, which does not improve following recruitment maneuvers, impaired lung compliance, increased dead space with high minute ventilation for sufficient carbon dioxide clearance, and slow recovery over a period of days to weeks with residual fibrosis. The diagnosis of acute respiratory distress syndrome, um, as defined by the Berlin criteria, is characterized by the following. The timing is when, within one week of known clinical insult. Chest imaging, most commonly a chest x-ray, shows bilateral opacities that's not fully explained by pleural effusions, lung collapse or lobar collapse, or lung nodules. And the origin of pulmonary edema cannot be explained by a cardiac etiology. Our ARDS is further characterized as mild, moderate, or severe by the PaO2 to FiO2 ratio. And one of the most important things to note is that this PaO2 to FiO2 ratio is always calculated with a minimum PEEP of 5. So severe ARDS is characterized by a PaO2 with an FiO2 of less than 100 millimeters of mercury. The pathophysiology of ARDS is complex and incompletely understood. Early stages of ARDS are characterized by diffuse alveolar damage with alveolar flooding with proteinaceous fluid, and deposition of hyaline membranes on the epithelial basement membrane, and formation of microthrombi. This leads to hypoxemia, impaired gas exchange, and decrease in overall lung compliance. 
Neutrophils also play an important role in the initial inflammatory response of ARDS. Over time, the acute inflammation and pulmonary edema becomes less prominent and the late stages of ARDS are characterized by fibrosis. Unfortunately, both benign and life-threatening respiratory conditions present with similar complaints such as dyspnea and cough during pregnancy. In your circumstances, a patient may deteriorate rapidly intraoperatively and you may not be able to oxygenate or ventilate the patient. While these images are often late findings in ARDS, it is important to have a high clinical suspicion and have a low threshold to obtain an arterial blood gas, a chest x-ray, and consultation with a critical care physician. I have also included echocardiographic findings that can be performed at the bedside. The image on the bottom right shows the parasternal long axis and shows that the left ventricular ejection fraction is normal. It also shows that the right ventricle does not appear distended and there's no evidence of a pericardial effusion. As you may recall, the respiratory failure in ARDS, according to the Berlin criteria, is not explained by cardiac failure, and that's why sometimes a bedside echocardiogram can be very useful. In addition, the top images are those of a lung ultrasound showing diffuse B lines suggestive of pulmonary edema. One of the most challenging aspects of critical illness in pregnancy is the management of two patients, and one cannot forget about the oxygenation of the fetus. Fetal oxygenation depends on placental blood flow, differences in partial pressure of oxygen between the mother and the fetus, oxygen content, and placental surface area. The priorities is always maternal stabilization as opposed to delivery of the compromised fetus, as stabilization of the mother often leads to improvement in fetal condition. Continuous fetal monitoring is useful in assessing how the fetus is tolerating any reduced oxygen delivery. The hypoxic fetus will show loss of variability and fetal tachycardia. Unfortunately, prolonged decelerations are a sign of fetal hypoxemia and acidemia and may require immediate delivery if not emergently corrected. One of the most reassuring things about the management of ARDS in pregnancy, if there's anything reassuring at all, is that all of the principles of treatment are relatively safe in pregnancy. That being said, all of the landmark studies in ARDS excluded pregnant women and the treatment has been extrapolated to our population. ARDS alone is not an indication for delivery. The fundamentals of treatment include identification and treatment of the underlying cause, avoiding volume overload, low tidal volume ventilation, prone position ventilation, and the application of pharmacologic therapies including neuromuscular blockade and steroids. If all of the above interventions fail, I recommend consideration of venovenous extracorporeal membrane oxygenation as salvage therapy. No one knows better than the obstetric anesthesiologist that the pregnant female has very little oxygen reserve and has the potential to desaturate very quickly following the administration of induction agents. Preoxygenation with high flow nasal cannula, non rebreather, or alternative forms of non invasive ventilation such as BiPAP may prevent maternal and fetal deterioration and need for emergent delivery at the time of intubation. Prolonged use of non-invasive ventilation should be used with caution. It should be reserved for patients with mild ARDS and those patients who are hemodynamically stable. A lack of clinical improvement or impaired oxygenation or improved oxygenation within 60 minutes after initiation should prompt evaluation for intubation and mechanical ventilation. Unfortunately, in patients with ARDS secondary to COVID, we are seeing rapid progression from nasal cannula to non-invasive ventilation and need for intubation within 24 hours of presentation to the hospital. In 1998, the first single center randomized control trial provided support for the use of low tidal volume ventilation in ARDS. 
the investigators compared low tidal volume ventilation to find as 6 mLs per kg and allowed permissive hypercapnia compared to conventional ventilation with a tidal volume of 12, 12 mLs per kg. They reported improved 28-day survival in the low tidal volume ventilation group. They also demonstrated reduced rates of barotrauma and increased rates of liberation from mechanical ventilation in the low tidal volume group. Following this single center study, a multi-center study known as the ARDS network enrolled over 800 patients and assigned them to low tidal volume ventilation, 6 mLs per kg, versus conventional ventilation, 12 mLs per kg. Enrollment was actually stopped early because the investigators also demonstrated improved survival in the low tidal volume ventilation group and a higher number of ventilation free days following randomization. Following these studies emerged the low tidal volume, low FiO2, and high PEEP strategy. Additional goals include maintaining a plateau pressure less than 30 and a driving pressure less than 15. In the injured lung, increases in tidal volume can lead to alveol alve alveolar overdistension. In addition, the cyclic opening and closing of the atelectatic alveoli can cause further injury by initiating a pro-inflammatory cytokine cascade. A ventilatory strategy that minimizes alveolar overdistension and maximizes alveolar recruitment is the cornerstone of a low tidal volume high PEEP strategy. The ACURACES trial performed in 2010 showed a statistically significant reduction in mortality in patients with moderate to severe ARDS treated with cisatricurium compa compared with deeply sedated controls. Over the past several years, as the treatment for ARDS has evolved, there has been a trend away from deep sedation. The ROSE trial was a multi-center, unblinded, randomized control trial among 48 ICUs in the United States and included patients with moderate to severe ARDS. The authors concluded that among patients with moderate to severe ARDS who were treated with a strategy involving a high PEEP, there was no significant difference in mortality at 90 days among patients that received early and continuous cisatricurium infusion and those whose were treated with a usual care approach with lighter sedation targets. However, it is important to note that only 16% of patients in the ROSE trial were prone. Despite these findings, we continually use neuromuscular blockade in the initial phases of treatment of ARDS along with prone position ventilation in order to prevent further lung damage due to maladaptive tachypnea, ventilator dyssynchrony, and allow patients to tolerate prone positioning. Next was the DEXA-ARDS trial, which, provided the which answered the clinical question, in patients with moderate to severe ARDS, does dexamethasone, in addition to routine care, compared with routine care alone, increase ventilator free days up to day 28. This was a randomized control trial that occurred among 17 ICUs in Spain from March 2013 to December 2018 and enrolled 277 patients. This occurred prior to the COVID-19 pandemic and the study was actually stopped early and due to low recruitment. As shown, Pregnant women and lactating women were excluded from the study. The intervention was the treatment with dexamethasone for a total of 10 days. The primary outcome was ventilator-free days, and the author showed a significant reduction in the intervention group. All secondary outcomes, including 60-day mortality, ICU mortality, duration of mechanical ventilation in ICU survivors, and the PaO2 to FiO2 ratio at six days all favored the intervention group with dexamethasone. The authors concluded that the early administration of dexamethasone could reduce the duration of mechanical ventilation and overall mortality in patients with established moderate to severe ARDS. 
The prone positioning and severe acute respiratory distress syndrome, or the PERCEVA trial, was also a landmark study in ARDS. In this randomized controlled trial, including 27 centers in Spain and France, the PERCEVA trial demonstrated that the early application of prone positioning showed an improved 28-day survival when compared to patients that were not prone. This study set the stage for our proning protocols, including prone positioning, for 16 hours per day for up to 28 days or until no further benefit is demonstrated. The prone position is beneficial in several ways. It generates a more homogeneous distribution of stress and strain in the lung parenchyma. It also leads to more homogeneous inflation of the lungs and decreasing the risk of tidal hyperinflation of non-dependent lung regions while decreasing the cyclic opening and closing of alveolar units in the dependent lungs, known as adelect trauma. Prone position improves lung recruitment by improving oxygenation in the dorsal aspect of the lungs, which actually makes up the greater lung mass. These changes in regional variation lead to a more homogeneous VQ distribution and less shunting. The prone position facilitates drainage of respiratory secretions. In the next slide, I will show you several images of how to prone the pregnant patient. Although the effectiveness of prone position ventilation has been demonstrated in several large randomized control trials, the safety and effectiveness of proning has yet to be determined in pregnancy. That being said, in, pregnant, in the pregnant patient with severe ARDS during the COVID-19 pandemic, our institution has been utilizing prone position ventilation. The image on the right provides an example of the padding that we use in order to support the shoulders and the hips so that the gravid uterus is suspended and free from compression on the bed. This position facilitates easy fetal monitoring and has been termed the A-frame. While case reports and case series have described the treatment of ARDS in pregnancy using low tidal volume ventilation, permissive hypercapnia, and prone position ventilation, I leave you with several additional thoughts as we approach these complex patients. These are questions that I contemplate every time we have a patient with ARDS and the answers are not well defined in the literature. The first question is how much permissive hypercapnia do we allow? We know that fetal perfusion and gas exchange is dependent on the oxygen and carbon dioxide gradients between the maternal and fetal circulations. In an acidotic mother, secondary to respiratory acidosis in the setting of permissive hypercapnia, the fetus is much more prone to developing acidemia much faster than hypoxemia. In the ARDSNET study, the mean partial pressure of carbon dioxide ranged from 40 to 44 on days one through seven in the low tidal volume ventilation group compared to 35 to 40 in the conventional tidal volume ventilation group. Not a significant difference in the PCO2. This is important because in the setting of a normal pH, the fetus often does tolerate brief periods of elevated partial pressure of carbon dioxide into the 40s. I would make the argument that when the partial pressure of carbon dioxide approaches 50, or when the pH becomes abnormal and acidotic, then one must consider a strategy to increase the minute ventilation or consider extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. The second question is, is low tidal volume ventilation appropriate for pregnant patients in, in whom there's a physiologic increase in tidal volume and minute ventilation in the second and third trimester? So the question then becomes, are it the, is it the lower tidal volume ventilation is more protective or is maintaining a plateau pressure less than 30 more protective? Of note, in the ARDSNAT trial, the conventional ventilation strategy with a tidal volumes of 12 ml per kg had plateau pressures up to 50 centimeters of water. No wonder we saw so much lung injury. We may only know the answer to this question if we looked at transpulmonary pressures during mechanical ventilation in the pregnant patient with ARDS, something that has not yet been done. And the last question I leave you with, is prone position as beneficial in pregnant patients as it is in non-pregnant patients? 
Proning is labor intensive. It may lead to difficulties in monitoring the fetus or intervening emergently in the setting of fetal distress. It can be associated with accidental extubation and rapid decompensation. And it's unclear if we see the same benefits in pregnancy because pregnancy is already a state of improved VQ matching as well as chest wall compliance. The ultimate question and one on all of our minds is does delivery improve maternal outcome? Currently, there is no clear recommendation as to whether delivery improves the clinical course of pregnant patients with ARDS. In a recent publication using data from the COVID-19 pandemic, the author sought to evaluate the effect of delivery on the PaO2 to FiO2 ratio. This was a retrospective cohort study among four hospitals in the United States within Texas, and the primary outcome was evaluated in 17 critically ill patients with severe ARDS. The slope of the P to F ratio before delivery is negative, indicating a decrease in the P to F across time. The slope after delivery was also negative, but less steep, indicating less of a decrease in the P to F ratio across time after delivery. It is important to note that among the patients with severe ARDS that were included in this analysis, only three patients were less than 32 weeks gestation potentially making the decision to deliver a little bit easier. So while, so while it seems there may be some benefit to delivery, it is not an easy decision, and one should consider the benefits of prolonging the pregnancy, especially if there is not a significant improvement in maternal respiratory status after delivery. The decision to prolong pregnancy for phenol benefit in pregnant women with ARDS is a challenging decision that requires a multidisciplinary approach. One of the most crucial determinants for delivery versus prolongation of the pregnancy is the gestational age of the fetus. However, other determinants that are equally important include critical care resources, neonatal and obstetric resources, reversibility of ARDS, maternal stability, and fetal status. Our recent institutional experience with COVID-19, with the COVID-19 pandemic has been reassuring for safely continuing pregnancy, at least until completion of antenatal corticosteroids and even into the late preterm or term gestation. As I'm sure everyone in the room has experienced, our critical care colleagues will look to the obstetric team to provide recommendations per, for pregnancy-specific hemodynamic, oxygenation, and ventilatory goals. I leave you with the following goals to share with our critical care colleagues. Normalizing the pH, maintaining a pCO2 less than 40, an SpO2 greater than 94%, a bicarbonate greater than 18, and a mean arterial pressure greater than 65. These are simple guidelines, but are tangible and promote optimal fetal perfusion. Our understanding of ARDS has never been so relevant as it is now during the COVID-19 pandemic, and I am very grateful for your attendance this afternoon. Respected chairpersons and friends, good evening to all. I thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak on this particular important topic called embolic disorders of pregnancy. Mostly we'll focus on thromboembolism and at the end, we'll also speak about uh, amniotic fluid embolism. That's important topic because we know there is a fourfold increase in the incidence of thromboembolic events in pregnancies as compared to non-pregnant status. 75% of the DVT occur in antepartum period. They also seen the increased incidence related to cesarean delivery as opposed to vaginal delivery. 60% of pulmonary embolisms can be in two weeks of postpartum period. And pulmonary embolism is the major non obstetric cause of maternal mortality, thereby giving fatality of 15%. Twice pregnancy also with increased tendency for clotting. I think it's nature's mechanism to have at the peripartum period where there's a possibility of bleeding, there should be an enhanced clotting so that the patient doesn't die of bleeding. This is just a logical thought, but it has its own extrapolations 
in an unfavorable manner in terms of having hypercoagulable states during the pregnancy all along. Also, there is a venous stasis in lower limbs. There is increased production of clotting factors, 5, 8, 1 Willebrand brand factor, and 5 million also. There can be seen some deficiency of anticoagulants like protein S and antithrombin. There is a decreased fibrinolytic activity via increased plasminogen activator inhibitor mechanism. And there also can be seen as endothelial damage, which can promote the coagulation in the circulation. Now, what are the various risk factors this particular subset of patients may have related to pregnancy as well as in general? Related to pregnancy, multiparity has its old role in enhancing the procoagulant status, preeclampsic toxemia, operative delivery, as we said before, and that two more which is an infection than vaginal delivery and also the previous bad obstetric history in terms of multiple abortions uh, fetal anomalies etc in general the factors could be the age over 35 years obesity immobility associated pelvic and leg trauma smoking history infections also a family and a personal history thrombophilic states and also presence of antiphospholipid antibodies and uh, lupus anticoagulant like factors and of course, atrial fibrillation, etc. We'll go through a case which is a twin pregnancy case, aged 30 years, and it's just a 27 year or 27 week pregnancy. She presented with fever with chills, dry cough, respiratory distress, tachycardia, and hypotension. And also, there was a past history of caesarean section done five years back for fetal distress, also, two MTPs done four and two years back for fetal anomalies, respectively. There was no evidence of DVT clinically. So it was suspected that she may be having pulmonary embolism. Now, when you suspect any case where there is a pulmonary embolism, it is very difficult to diagnose condition unless you have a particular system of clinical substantiation done by various scoring systems or clinical uh, methods which are being used, you know, which are in practice. Now, this is one of the commonly used waste diagnostic scoring system where the points are given for a clinical feature which will be significant or predisposing to a DVT or thrombotic uh, thromboembolic condition. Clinical symptoms of DVT, other diagnosis less likely than PE, heart rate which is greater than 100, immobilization or surgery within last four weeks, previous history, hemoptysis, malignancy, all these are being given respective points and a probability of diagnosis uh, being there as a pulmonary embolism is done depending on the score. This is another system, revised Geneva scoring and uh, clinical probability accordingly can be predicted where there is a possibility of pulmonary embolism or not and uh, multiple factors are taken into consideration in terms of age, previous history, surgery and so on. This is another one. There is also something called a pulmonary embolism rule out criteria PERC and it also takes multiple predisposing factors into consideration and tries to predict what is the possibility of uh, thromboembolic event or pulmonary embolism in this particular patient. Now, various investigations will be needed after you suspect the clinical uh, condition called pulmonary embolism or thromboembolic condition. There can be non-invasive set or invasive. Invasive is uh, obviously pulmonary angiography, but it comes only after the non-invasive set is been done and which will include uh, like D-dimers, ECG, ABG, drop TB, NP, etc. And as simple as X-ray, Doppler, uh, ultrasound, Doppler digital duplex Doppler, echocardiography, and of course, MRI and VQ scan. And the uh, CTPA probably is the one of the most commonly done currently uh, before one goes really for pulmonary angio, which will be necessary in few of the patients. Now, case continues. Uh, patient's 2D echo was done. It showed dilated right atrium and right ventricle. Uh, there was a systolic pressure rise in pulmonary artery. Coagulation was normal, but platelets were found to be on lower side, 33,000. Lower limb Doppler, uh, there was no evidence of a deep venous thrombosis. And pulmonary CT angio was highly suggestive of pulmonary embolism. As you can see, there is a rise in pulmonary systolic pressure. RARV are dilated and there is a normal, uh, there is a right ventricular dysfunction also. So this is a typical echocardiography report in this particular patient. As you can see, uh, there is a less or decreased perfusion on the left side here and probably there is a possibility of embolic embolus presence in that particular area which was confirmed on the ctpa and uh, it did show that on the left side there was a, a, a thromboembolism in this particular patient the impression did show that there is a pulmonary uh, 
embolism there and uh, there is a wedge shape non enhancing hypodensity lesion in the posterior segment of right lower lobe as well as a uh, few on the left side now once you get this particular report we need to find out whether this patient fits into high risk or a low risk now high risk will have a different kind of treatment approach and that's why it's very essential that we try to find out what is the risk of pulmonary embolism in this particular patient now there are very uh, various clinical and lab parameters which can be used and especially when there is a presence of uh, shock index which is more than one there is a right ventricular hypokinesia right ventricular dilatation right ventricular systolic pressure uh, more than 40 with uh, troponin and uh, other markers which are on higher side uh this will indicate that there is a possibility of a very high risk and uh, pulmonary embolism become the really a probable uh, condition in this situation uh this particular case probably has all of these and that's why this becomes a very high probability or high risk case for uh pulmonary embolism so all these were present in this particular patient so risk stratification has its own implication because uh, if there is a high risk the mortality is more than 15% so one has to find out pro or prognosticate especially when we talk to the relations what is the probability of clinical course being very bad or a morbid in this particular patient that will be based on our assessment by risk stratification done by various methods as we said before now the case continues to deco as i said uh, and uh, to deco and uh, Palmer City and you were suggestive of pulmonary embolism, so she received heparin bolus and infusion and uh, was not thrombolyzed in view of thrombocytopenia and pregnancy. Now, who will receive the anticoagulation? Uh, most of the patients with a suspicion of DVT or evidence of DVT or pulmonary embolism will receive anticoagulation, and often it is in the form of uh, infractional heparin or low molecular weight heparin. it will be started immediately when you suspect it and the dose is typically 5000 to 10000 uh, units given as a bolus followed by 1000 or 1500 units per hour targeting to aptt of 1.5 to 2.5 in that range you can give alternatively enoxaparin and uh, it can be in the dose of 1 mg per kg pd or 1.5 mg per kg in the pd and uh, it is preferred because it has a less incidence of heparin induced thrombocytopenia it is longer acting and uh, that's why it is preferred only place where it will not be preferred will be uh, renal insufficiency where unfractional heparin will be given now when to add oral anticoagulation in pregnancy these are contraindicated but when the patient is not pregnant the other subset of patients they will be given in terms of warfarin or even the newer oral anticoagulation agents now there is a typical overlap done because there is a protein c uh, protein s uh, affected by warfarin itself so to have a, a procoagulant state balance to be balanced heparin is continued for overlapping of or 4 to 5 days now typically the discontinuation of heparin will be after 4 or 5 days and uh, we need to find out whether inr is gone in acceptable range of more than 2 to contain a uh anticoagulation states now duration of treatment is typically uh, up to 2 weeks postnatally for dvt continue through all along the antepartum period and for pulmonary embolism it happens at any point of time it the anticoagulation will continue for 6 weeks postnatally what about the uh, pulmonary embolism and uh, drug and indicate uh, indications of thrombolysis now could this particular patient who is pregnant of 27 weeks be thrombolyzed now literature does not show a strong evidence by prospective data in pregnant patients obviously there are limitations doing a prospective analysis or study there are only case series but there has been reasonable substantiation for giving thrombolysis in indicated cases now we'll see which cases are kind of indication for thrombolysis and uh, the literature does show that there is a beneficial outcome and uh, there is a relatively low risk of complications which are often feared in terms of bleeding etc pulmonary embolism in pregnancy there has been enough literature review in, and this recent uh, review in 20, 2019 concluded that the risk of using thrombolytics in pregnancy seem to be reasonably taking into account the risk of death in life threatening condition because intermediate or uh, high risk pulmonary embolism the death risk is much higher than probably the risk of a uh, side effect of a thrombolytic agent which you are going to use the complication rate of thrombolytic treatment does not seem higher in pregnant women than in the non pregnant patient because this was one of the worry 
Now, there will be few contraindications to thrombolysis, stroke in last six months, GI bleed, history of major trauma and tumors of CNS. Now, there will be many relative contraindications and one in that is pregnancy or uh, within one week of postpartum period where you will not be able to use thrombolysis. There are many others, but which is relevant to us to this. Now, there are a lot of advantages over other modes. Basically, uh, thrombolysis can uh, reverse the pulmonary hypertension and the right ventricular dysfunction. It can uh, lead to decrease in the mortality. It will obviously increase the pulmonary, uh, improve the pulmonary hypertension. And source of thrombus also can be dissolved so that a recurrence of thromboembolic event subsequently also can be limited. Now, this is a typical chart showing what happens to which group of patients. Low risk patient goes only for anticoagulation. Intermediate risk patient will go for anticoagulation plus thrombolysis and high risk patient will obviously go for uh, heparin, uh, anticoagulation, thrombolysis and some interventions in terms of catheter based techniques or thrombectomy at uh, point in time. The only agent which has now been popular is altiplase and uh, it is being given uh, the dose of 10 mg bolus and 90 mg intravenous infusion given over two hours. Uh, urokinase and streptokinase have been used before LTPLA was available, but the other uh, agents like retiplase and tenicliplase are yet to find approval for use or their use in primary embolism. Dose of uh, LTPLAs is uh, 15 mg bolus with 85 mg infusion over 2 hours and if the weight exceeds uh, 67 kgs, then obviously this is the dosage. Dr. Uh, Sonali Kobrabadi is associate professor. Now, in the intermediate risk category, as I said, the thrombolysis can be indicated and uh, these particular subset of patients, if not thrombolyzed, up to 50% of them can deteriorate later and uh, become a high risk uh, patient of pulmonary embolism, causing shock and thereby probably a mortality. Prognosis worsens due to recurrent PEs as well. And that also indicates that uh, whenever you have intermediate risk, to prevent the recurrent pulmonary embolism later on, it is better to thrombolyze these patients. Uh, heparin plus passive one. This is one of the trials which was in way back in 2002. Did show that probability of 30 day event uh, free survival was higher in heparin plus alteplase group as compared to placebo plus heparin. This is another study which was later in 2010 and uh, comparing alteplase plus heparin versus anticoagulants alone showed that total median hospital stay was significantly shorter in the alteplase group by indicating the superiority of alteplase. Uh, another recent study in 2014 also supported that thrombolysis can improve the outcome of the pulmonary embolism cases if thrombolyzed. And this is one of the recent ones, the uh, Seattle trial uh, also showed the similar result. So there is a reasonable encouragement in having a thrombolysis done without worrying too much or without uh, kind of taking note of side effects, uh, outweighing the benefit of thrombolysis and it will be better any patients actually suitable, if suitable, undergo thrombolysis. Now, this is another trial which was again in 2014 and uh, this was obviously a DEMA trial showing low-dose catheter-directed ultrasound accelerated thrombolysis with small doses of TPA which was given inside the pulmonary circulation and of course it showed right ventricular dilatation reversal and improvement in the dysfunction in 24 hours. So that's a dramatic effect, which is a much more precise method than giving a systemic thrombolytic agents. Uh, the cases which are probable but are not confirmed also make a case for thrombolytic agents because uh, this particular trial, MOPED trial, showed less than 50% of the standard dose of TPA can be safer. So if there is a doubt in diagnosis, you may use lesser dose, that is less than 50% dose, that is 40 milligrams instead of 90 milligrams of LTPLH or TP. So uh, this indicates again that thrombolysis, even with lesser doses in even suspected cases can outweigh the benefit of uh, thrombolysis as compared to the problems which could be uh, predicted as a side effect. A massive pulmonary embolism obviously has a very high mortality. It's a medical emergency. It's very, very aggressive approach. And Two-third die in first two hours itself. Precession may be attempted, but it usually fails. Pulmonary angiography may show that there is a massive pulmonary embolism, anticoagulation, thrombolysis, and of course, interventions of this kind, that is embolectomy, surgical or percutaneous interventions can be required in this particular condition. Now, pulmonary embolism can be of late being treated with a catheter-based therapy. And basically, those uh, very few centers may be having it, but it can be very, very rewarding, especially in the high-risk cases or uh, massive pulmonary embolism. 
Now goals here obviously are rapid reduction in pulmonary artery pressure, right ventricular pulmonary vascular resistance, and uh, increasing the systemic circulation. Otherwise, the patients may die. Now there can be interventions of various kinds, and aspiration thrombectomy and thrombus fragmentation are the two which are in vogue now. Catheter embolectomy uh, is a special device required for this particular purpose. The approach obviously is one of the major ways. Thrombus removed by suction, mechanical fragmentation locally done there, and uh, there could be injection of local thrombolytic agent to uh, dissolve them further. Possible complications are cardiac arrhythmias, pulmonary reperfusion injury, and pulmonary hemorrhage. But I think the benefit really will outweigh as compared to what the complications may be predicted uh, predict or the, they are known to us. There can be ultrasound assisted low dose TPA catheter based therapy. This will be very precise because uh, you will have a use of ultrasound and you can put a catheter at appropriate place where uh, thrombus lies and uh, in uh, lesser doses, obviously, you'll be able to have some kind of a thrombolysis. Now, in 2015, obviously, uh, prospective single arm multicenter trial of ultrasound facilitated catheter directed low dose fibrinolysis was tried and uh, uh, this is also known as the Seattle 2 study, where they concluded that there is a definite benefit. Decreased right ventricular dilatation, reduced pulmonary hypertension, decreased anatomic uh, thrombus burden, and minimized intraclinal hemorrhage. So this will substantiate, because this is a recent trial and uh, should substantiate the use of thrombolysis done by more precise manner with uh, advanced technology. Now, are there surgical uh, options and where they are necessary? Basically, they'll be all necessary in massive pulmonary embolism. And uh, especially when thrombolysis is contraindicated, we have no option but to go for such kind of a surgical intervention. Uh, obviously, it will be done in the uh, with the cardiopulmonary bypass in the operation theater. And it's been reported that 89% survival rate, according to one of the study in USA. So this is very promising and uh, at suitable uh, our situation, this option obviously needs to be entertained. In uh, 2016, this was reported in Journal of American College of Cardiology, uh, and the investigation obviously was uh, of the trends in management and outcomes of acute pulmonary embolism analysis from the RIT. So, in this, uh, 23,000 patients were followed from uh, 2001 to 2013. So, very over a prolonged period, uh, this kind of analysis was done. And they did find that the mean length of stay decreased from 13.6 uh, to 9.3 over 13 years. Low molecular weight heparin increased its use. Unfractional heparin decreased its use. Thrombolytic therapy use had gone up. Surgical embolectomy has also got doubled. And risk adjusted rates of all cause mortality decreased from 6.6% to 4.9% uh, in the beginning and at the end of this particular decade. Also, PE-related mortality decreased over time, 3.3% in 2001 uh, and 2005 in those five years to 1.8%. So there is a almost more than 50% decrement in the pulmonary embolism mortality. That's a very significant. Other aspect is use of uh, uh, IVC filters. There are multiple commercial filters available. But what are the indications of this filter? Basically, it cannot be used as routinely as an adjuvant to anticoagulation. Mostly they use a retrievable so that uh, they can be taken out after some time, uh, short term of uh, fixing it in the intravena cava. Anticoagulation should be restarted after contraindications uh, to anticoagulation have been dissolved. So now uh, anticoagulation does remain a mainstay, but if there is a contraindication to anticoagulation, the IVC filters can be as an interim major. Uh, basically, the three major indications where IVC filter will be necessary. Contraindication to anticoagulation, poor cardiopulmonary reserve, and possibility of recurrent pulmonary embolism. So the case continued. The case obviously uh, was quite morbid, uh, remained hypohemodynamically stable without much uh, vasopressor support. Later had a PR bleed because she had anal fissure. She needed uh, a paxil volume transfusions later on. On day five, she needed intubation because respiratory distress increased and she was mechanically ventilated. Subsequently, because she was intubated, there was advice from obstetrician to subject her to a caesarean section, which was done. Now, there can be debate about whether surgeon section to be done at this particular point or not, because probably it may not have that much impact on the disease morbidity, that is pulmonary embolism morbidity and subsequent clinical course. But this remains a very debatable issue. Could be extubated in a few days, later on put on uh, oral anticoagulation, 
in terms of dabigatran 150 mg bd but needed uh, non nasal ventilation high flow nasal oxygen subsequently intermittently thrombolysis was uh, reconsidered but was not done because of some episodes of bleeding here and there and uh, probably she was not doing too well so it was uh, not entered at that particular point of time she later on deteriorated uh, and had hemoptysis and uh, obviously had some infection and died later on so we are not very sure whether thrombolysis was could have been a right choice right in the beginning in this particular case but retrospectively speaking with a few bleeding episodes uh, maybe it could not have been uh, that beneficial so uh, recent guidelines from european uh, cardiology society regarding pulmonary embolism in pregnancy the use of anticoagulation is outright there whenever you suspect immediately even before the diagnosis is confirmed thrombolysis and surgical embolectomy for high risk p is the recommended thrombolytic treatment should not be used peripartum except in the setting of life threatening pulmonary embolism so some reservations are bound to be there and uh, peripartum use obviously will be discouraged because there can be a mass hemorrhage in case there is a uh, 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 there is a delivery occurring in that particular period old and newer agents which are anticoagulant oral anticoagulation agent are not recommended in pregnancy and lactation so in their place obviously parents will be used so just to revise the same chart where uh, we find that low risk p obviously will be treated with heparin and anticoagulation intermediate ones going for heparin and thrombolysis the high risk patients or high risk p will be going for anticoagulation in addition to that there can be a thrombolysis used or there can be intervention in terms of catheter based techniques ultrasound used uh, or ultrasound based techniques for uh, precise uh, delivery of anti thrombotic uh, thrombolytic agent and of course thrombectomy as a surgical option in a very massive p uh, condition coming to uh, amniotic fluid embolism uh, it's a sudden unexpected and life threatening basically it has a very complex pathogenesis and multiple systems get involved once uh, amniotic fluid embolism occurs it has a very high morbidity and mortality and it often remains diagnosed by exclusion because uh, it it can be very difficult to diagnose there is sudden uh, onset of uh, variable grades of respiratory distress and circulatory collapse there can be seizures or unexplained fetal distress and abnormal bleeding basically uh, clinical presentation uh, is very variable depending on how many systems are involved at that particular point but the initial uh, symptoms are usually with the respiratory distress and uh, there can be a shock status followed by a multi system affection uh, is, uh, presented with uh, multiple complaints the multiple features a lot of investigations will be needed because uh, this is a multi system problem and from complete blood count to echocardiography all the investigations will be needed to rule out many conditions before you come to conclusion of amniotic fluid embolism so there can be huge differential diagnosis set of this uh, condition which will include right from anaphylaxis to aortic dissection and uh, list is as big we need to somehow rule out all these conditions before we label this as the case of amniotic fluid embolism because amniotic fluid embolism will not have a specific treatment and we have to support all the multi system morbidity which is occurring along with it while if you diagnose some other disorder which can have a some specific treatment and uh, which obviously will be much more rewarding than assuming that it is a amniotic fluid embolism now goals of the management obviously will be to have re uh, institution of uh, restoration of cardiac and pulmonary morbidity to get adequate urine output indicating the perfusion has uh, got restored and uh, basically coagulation abnormalities which can cause mass hemorrhage in this particular subset of patients uh, because of the peripartum period may be there and uh, obviously we will need to have a backup of component therapy as much possibly necessary in this particular uh, situation basically management will involve the hemodynamic optimization with the use of uh, central venous para pressure monitoring or even intra arterial uh, pressure monitoring and in some patients obviously pulmonary artery capillary wh pressures echocardiography will also help to make uh, precise decisions about uh, fluids and vasopressors to be given optimally <clears throat> uh, dic is very very commonly seen in this and it just cause depletion of lot of factors so we will need blood components in variable quantities the role of steroids is not clearly known but people are using steroids in this particular condition so this is all about the embolic disorders in pregnancy and uh, we try to throw some more light on 
uh, additional use of thrombolytic agents, especially with the use of technological assistance in terms of ultrasound guided or even the interventions of surgical kind in a massive pulmonary embolism. There can always be a problem of taking a decision to go for this because patient is actually dying and uh, getting concerted syrup becomes a problem. But I think multiple centers with now are geared up for this kind of intervention and we might uh, in future see that these patients are saved more in numbers than before. I thank you for your kind patience. Thank you very much. Any questions which can be entertained at the end?